So it is my uh, great honor to be here this evening. I am so pleased. And uh, um, I wanted to mention that um, while I am involved in many different organizations and um, affiliations, as was mentioned, I'm not representing any of them tonight. I'm just representing my own personal perspective so that I can share with you a little bit more of some of my own uh, uh, thoughts on some of these issues we'll talk tonight about tonight. So um, we're looking to the heavens, and um, I hope you'll be inspired by them this evening. Um, okay, so this is me. Um, and behind this, you see the Whirlpool Nebula, as imaged by the Hubble Space Telescope, which is one of many professional telescopes that are available these days. You see a model of it right there next to me. Um, and with the Hubble, we can see beautiful images, um, such as this one. Here's a, an example of an interstellar nebula, a cloud of gas where stars have recently formed. So in the middle you see some of these bright young stars still surrounded by the colorful gas and dust out of which they formed. Because our telescopes have been getting better and better, we are able to see uh, the, the, de the intricate details and colors of regions like this that are very active and fruitful. So it's my privilege to be able to work with telescopes like this um, but that hasn't always been my life. As I mentioned to you in the uh, conversation uh, just now, um, I actually grew up on a farm. So, uh, so an Arkansas Ozark farm with uh, raising cattle. Um, that I'm the one in the middle there, okay, in case you were wondering. <laughs> so this is a cold January day. I'm wearing multiple layers of clothes and feeding cattle, but I just wanted to show you that, um, you know, I grew up in, a, in an area where being out in nature was, was a common part of daily life, and I think that's very important. It can inspire all of us, even if you don't live on a farm, but if you can get outside and look at trees and, you know, feel what tree bark feels like and walk around in the woods and listen to streams and look up at the birds, it can really enhance our experience of what it means to be human in a broader natural universe. So I grew up in this environment, and as you heard earlier, um, I was able then to take that love of nature and bring it on uh, into a professional career studying space. And indeed, space is magnificent. So uh, this is an example, this is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope of a cluster of stars called Omega Centauri. It's a very dense cluster of stars in our own galaxy, and we can tease out individual stars in this picture because the telescope that took it is, is in space, the, Hel the Hubble Space Telescope, and gets very sharp angular resolution as it's observing things, so you can differentiate star from star in this crowded region. If you were to look at this region with uh, a telescope on the ground, probably all the starlight from the different stars would kind of blend together, so you'd see kind of a, a light smudge. But here you can see individual stars. It's quite majestic. To me, it looks like a collection of gemstones. And you can tell here that stars are not all the same. So I would like to ask, especially some of the young people in the room, what different colors you see as you look at these stars. I mean, you can just yell them out. What colors do you see? Okay, I think we got them all. <laughs> so we see reds and greens and yellows um, and, and, and whites and different colors of stars. Now, unfortunately, I can't call on you individually because with the bright lights, I cannot see you individually. But let me ask um, for a little more voice participation here. Why do you think the stars are different colors? Okay. All right, so I've heard, I've heard some good answers here. Um, now, so I asked you why they're different. Um, whoops, there went my pointer. Um, I've asked you why they are different colors, but uh, I could also ask you why do some of them look brighter than others? What do you think? 
Go ahead, yell it out. Why are some brighter than others? <laughs> okay, so you're all right, okay? So these are all different colors of stars. Um, and they're different colors because they are different temperatures and their outer atmospheres. They're all hot, so they're all like, you know, our sun is just a star. If it were in this picture, it would look like one of those smaller yellowish, whitish colored objects there. So our sun is, is a star. It's kind of average, maybe slightly above average in its, in its size and mass. Stars are different brightnesses because they are different temperatures. They're all hot, but different levels of heat in their outer atmosphere. They're different, uh, they look different brightnesses. Um, in general, when you look up at the sky, some stars look brighter and some stars look less bright, but you don't know whether the ones that are more bright are, seem more bright are more bright because they're closer to us or because they're actually intrinsically brighter. So some of them can be farther away from us, some of them closer. In this case, all of these stars are, are kind of bound near to each other because of their mutual gravity in this cluster. So they're all at pretty much the same distance from us. So the brighter stars here truly are intrinsically brighter. So I can, you, know, you can tell from this image alone that stars are not all the same. Now, I'm just showing you some of this initially to kind of show you the beauty and majesty of the heavens and to show you that you can be inspired by it. And in fact, we even have philosophical thought about this from ages past. Um, uh, Immanuel Kant said that two things continued to fill his mind with ever increasing awe and admiration the more he reflected upon them. And those two things were the starry heavens above him and the moral law within him. And that's a very interesting thought. You know, this is written, as I understand, on his tombstone and, and translated here into English. But even today, there are, there are these two facets of our existence that we continue to think about. The starry heavens above us, and, and I think in general about just the natural world fascinates public conversation now. What is, where, where do we fit into the universe? And even on the very small scale, what are we made of in, a, in the very small scale as well? And then the moral law within, and that can translate now into our societal discussions of justice and why do we have this sense of right and wrong? Um, where does that come from and who gets to decide what's right and wrong? These are the conversations that continue to fill uh, our society's contemplations today. And in fact, a Christian a scholar, C.S. Lewis, he came to faith, to his Christian faith when he contemplated these things and was wondering where people have a sense of, of moral law and of right and wrong within them. Where does that come from? All right, so the heavens can be part of our inspiration as human beings. All right, if you take home only one or two messages from this, one of them I want you to take home is that the universe we live in is beautiful. And let's look a little more closely than that, at that. You've already seen some beauty. Um, here's a region of the sky taken with a telescope on the ground. And I'm going to be showing you images from different kinds of telescopes because different kinds of telescopes have different capabilities. So while I'm a big fan of the Hubble Space Telescope because it gets very sharp images and it's very sensitive, but it only has a small field of view. It can't see a big field in the sky. Here's a bigger field of view in the sky taken with a very good telescope that's, that's not in space, that's on the ground. This is a region of the sky you can see pretty prominently in the winter when you go out at night, if you do on a dark night. Does anybody know what this constellation is called? Orion. Exactly. All right. So this is Orion. Um, you can see it there. It, uh, this is Orion's belt and Orion's sword and the classical view of, of this arrangement of stars of Orion, the hunter or the warrior. Now, when I was growing up and looked outside, I used to think of my own constellations, and there's no reason why you can't imagine your own constellations when you look up in the sky. So to me, this looks like a kite, right? With the kite here and the kite tail right there. Um, this big red star, anybody know what that is? Betelgeuse, big, big unstable star. It's probably going to explode any time now in the next, uh, you know, million years, something like that. So, <laughs> and... Uh, Rigel down here is very bright. 
But if you look closely at some of these stars, even with binoculars, you'll see that they look kind of fuzzy. And astronomers call anything that looks kind of fuzzy, we call it a nebula. So if you look around this, this area, you see there's kind of nebulous emission around some of these stars. They aren't distinct stars. So let's zoom in now with the Hubble Space Telescope that doesn't see this full field of view, but can see this little region right here in much greater detail. And when we do that, we're going to look right there at that little pinkish nebula region. It looks like this, OK? So this is the Orion Nebula blown up so you can see it a little better. And it's full of this lit up gas and dust. The reason it's this colorful brightness is because stars have recently coalesced out of this gas. And when a star turns on, the biggest, brightest stars have enough energy in their photons of light that the light goes back out into the interstellar gas and ionizes it. It's called lighting it up or ionizing it. It makes these colors. So when astronomers see a nebula, a nebula like this, we say not only, wow, isn't that beautiful, but we say, wow, that's a signpost that stars are still forming in this region and they haven't had enough time yet for the, the, the winds and the, the radiation from the stars to kind of blow away the leftover gas. Well, that's a beautiful nebula right there. Here's another one. And a lot of times in these regions, you'll see um, kind of pillar-like structures. These are formed when stars, which recently form out of this gas, when the winds and the radiation from stars get hit back the surrounding gas and kind of carve out these structures for a while. So, off to the right here would be some newly formed stars. The radiation and the winds from those stars hit the surrounding gas. The, the denser clumps remain longer and the shadows behind it. So you get these kind of pillar-like majestic structures. Here's another one of these. Um, and this one I think is quite intriguing. It looks like, to me, the head of a dragon. But the name of this is the Horsehead Nebula. So can you try to imagine seeing either a horse or a dragon in this beautiful nebula? This picture was taken not just in the regular visible light that we can see with our eyes, but with another kind of light called infrared light. And infrared light enables us to see around some of this dusty nebulous region around. And it's quite beautiful, kind of eerie in a sense. So stars and these gas clouds and nebulae, they fill up the volume of a collections that we call galaxies. So you saw some galaxies in the, the, the film that opened up this evening's event. This is an example of a beautiful galaxy. Um, it's spiral in its structure. So there's so, much, so many stars that the starlight kind of blends together in the core there and gives you this bright glow. And then you see these kind of pinwheel structures in this type of spiral galaxy coming out. We think our own Milky Way galaxy looks something like this, and I'll show you a diagram of it in a minute, but we can't get all the way out of our own Milky Way galaxy yet far enough to look back and take a picture. We have to kind of surmise it from looking around inside. But this is what another similar galaxy looks like. It's quite beautiful. There are probably at least 200 billion stars in this galaxy, as well as all of the gas and dust. You can't really see the individual stars, but the light's blended together. If you look carefully in this beautiful Hubble image, you can see other galaxies in the background. Here's one, here's one, here's one. Um, and this is also a beautiful, beautiful um, galaxy. And so astronomers, as I like to point out, are so taken with its beauty that they named it NGC 1309. Um, we don't have enough poets in our field. <laughs> our own Milky Way, an artist's conception, we think it looks something like this, with our sun sitting out here near one of these spiral arms. So when we look around, our planets are all orbiting tightly around this, this star, so our existence is here, but we can look with our telescopes and look around. We can look along the plane of our galaxy, which is kind of flattened. And then you, if you look along that plane, you see a whole lot of stars, especially if you look toward the center of the galaxy, but in any direction. So if you really go to a very dark place, you can see at night a kind of a swath of whitish light across the sky. That's what you're seeing from looking through across the plane, the disk of our galaxy, with all the starlight blending together. If you look in other directions, you see fewer stars. 
And we can see um, uh, um, star forming regions in the arms of the system right around our solar system as well. All right, so we use different kinds of telescopes. We use telescopes on the ground, we use telescopes in space. This is an example. This is the Hubble Space Telescope. It's a satellite, it's orbiting planet Earth. So here up in space, you can look down and see the surface of planet Earth. Anybody know why we would want to put a telescope up in space? You can yell it out because I can't see you. Okay. I'm hearing. Good answers. All right. We put telescopes in space to get them above the clouds. You see all these clouds? Clouds are beautiful. I'm glad for them. But when you're trying to do astronomy, they can get in the way. So if we can get, sometimes we put telescopes on the tops of mountains. And that's good. That gets above some of the atmosphere. But if you can get the telescope way up high, you can actually see much clearer pictures. So what this telescope does is it observes stars and galaxies it's not very far from the surface of the Earth, so it's not very far away. It's just above the, the clouds. And then it transmits those images back to the ground. Now, just a little history lesson here. Our telescopes have become better and better over the years. So this little chart shows you, if you can read this chart, the last few centuries. So these are years from the 1600s, 1700s, so forth and so forth, 20th century and beyond. What's happened to our technology over the years. Our sensitivity of our telescopes has gotten better over time. So we go back uh, several centuries to Galileo. And Galileo was the first person we know of that did recorded observations of celestial objects using a telescope. And he recorded the movement of these little lights around Jupiter, which turned out to be orbiting moons around Jupiter. Now you can see those very same moons with your binoculars if you go have good binoculars and go out on a dark night look at Jupiter. Over the years, the sensitivity, telescopes have gotten better, eyepieces have gotten better, the sensitivity has improved. The scale over here is a logarithmic scale, so every factor, every tick mark here, you're getting 10 times better than the one below it. So by the point we get to the 20th century, people are taking photographs through telescopes, recording light for longer periods of time than you can just stare and, and see something. And that's how we got to understand better that there were probably other galaxies outside our own. And then electronic recording improved the sensitivity even more. And then we launched the Hubble telescope into space, which gave us orders of magnitude more sensitivity. And over the years, astronauts have serviced the Hubble Space Telescope over and over again. So that's taken us off the charts with the last servicing mission, servicing mission four. I'm showing you this so you can understand that there's a parallel between improvements in optics and technology and engineering and these deeper scientific understandings of who we are and where we fit in the universe. And that leads to richer conversations about the philosophy and the implications of what we're finding. Astronauts have improved the Hubble telescope several times by going up to visit it. So this crew of astronauts went up in 2009 for the last time on the space shuttle. And they put on their spacesuits for several days, went out of the pressurized compartment of the space shuttle, and went out to the Hubble telescope that they had pulled in with a robotic arm into the payload bay of the space shuttle. And they did servicing tasks. They repaired some a broken equipment on the telescope and they installed a new camera and a new instrument called a spectrograph and they've left the Hubble telescope in terrific shape so the Hubble Space Telescope is working very well right now I'm very grateful for that there are other space telescopes as well there's the Chandra X-ray Observatory and the Spitzer Infrared Observatory and quite a few other uh, te space telescopes in operation right now and soon to be in operation and quite a few telescopes on the ground as well, radio telescopes and other types of telescopes. Why do we need these different kinds of telescopes? Well, it's because each one has a unique skill, if you will. Some telescopes see visible light, some see x-ray emission, some see infrared, some see broad fields of view, some see narrow fields of view in more detail. We use these different telescopes like a like, uh, I, I like to think of it like a symphony orchestra where the conductor needs all different kinds of instruments working together to get a fuller beauty of the music. We need all these different kinds of telescopes to give us a fuller, more informed sense of what we're studying, whether it's planets or stars or galaxies. 
And so our new camera that we um, installed in 2009, the astronauts installed, is enabling us to get pictures like this cluster that you just saw and seeing it in many different colors, not only visible light, but infrared light and ultraviolet light as well. Now it's helpful to see things in context. So this is an interesting cluster of stars, but let's look at the bigger picture. If we look at where this fits in, this is a picture taken from the ground. So you get a bigger field of view toward the center of our own galaxy. You see a lot of dust and a lot of stars. And some of these stars are not actually individual stars. They're actually clusters. And so um, this particular um, image that I showed you, let me see if I can, I just so want to, to uh, get this to work better so that I can. Um. Ah, here we go. We're going to zoom in. And from this, you can actually see that this is a whole cluster of stars, and we're going to transition over to the Hubble Space Telescope image where you see now. So you see context matters. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can... Uh, um, to, uh, do this one more time. Here we go. So that's a constellation. And we're zooming in to what looked like a star, but now we can tell it's a globular cluster of stars. And then we're going to transition over to the Hubble image that gives us uh, more detail. And there you can see the detail. All right? So perspective matters. All right, so you've seen the universe is beautiful. The next concept I want you to take in is that the universe is active. It's not just stagnant. You know, we think about stars and planets, and sometimes you may think that they're just kind of out there, sitting there, but things are actually quite busy out there. Um, for one, here's, anybody know what this is? Jupiter. All right, so this is a picture of Jupiter, and it's taken in different colors of light in the visible light wavelength, and this is, this is also a Hubble Space Telescope image with the newest camera on Hubble. You can see these beautiful atmospheric bands. So Jupiter is a gas giant planet. It's mostly gas, um, but in ultraviolet light, you can actually see something going on at the poles. Dancing around here are the aurorae. So Jupiter has very active magnetic fields. The magnetic fields channel charged particles um, from space onto the poles of the planet, and uh, you can see it light up when those charged particles um, hit the poles here of the planet, and it lights up in ultraviolet light. So using these different kinds of eyes, we can see different kinds of features and it's actively happening. In fact, we just, uh, NASA sent a probe called Juno recently into the environment of Jupiter to study its magnetic field and other things. And so simultaneously, the Hubble telescope is studying the aurorae on the poles of Jupiter to see how the magnetic field is affecting that kind of emission. This is a giant red spot. Some of you have studied this. It's a big storm. It's like a huge hurricane. Um, but it turns out that that huge hurricane, when you get to look at it over and over again, as we've done with the Hubble Space Telescope, it's, um, it's actually changing in size. So um, here's how it looked in 2014, but here's how it looked in 1995 and 2009. So actually this storm is getting smaller over time, and new little storms are cropping up, so we can tell actually that the weather is changing on Jupiter. All right. Planets are dynamic. Stars' formation is dynamic. I told you that there's these interstellar nebulae where stars continue to form. And in many of these regions, as I mentioned, you see these long pillar-like structures. This is a famous image from Hubble of the Eagle Nebula with three of these pillars of dense gas where new stars are probably still forming because it's such dense material. But it's impossible in regular visible light to see inside these dense pillars unless you can look in with infrared light. So the newest camera on the Hubble telescope has infrared capabilities, so you can actually see inside these pillars. This is the same object, the Eagle Nebula, in visible light and infrared light. And the infrared capabilities allows you to see through some of the dusty veil in front of this material. You can see many more stars, and you can actually see into some of these pillars where you see hot spots where we call protostars are forming. They're coalescing clumps of gas that are falling in because of their own self-gravity and heating up as they become 
uh, baby stars. All a star is is just a collapsed ball of gas that has so much pressure in the core that the hydrogen atoms start a reaction called fusion, and fusion releases photons of light. All right, here's another uh, image of activity going on. This is another interstellar cloud where there's a baby star forming in here. Actually, there are several. But they go through a phase where infalling material gets actually expelled from the poles of these baby stars. It has to do with magnetic fields. So you can see this jet-like emission here, right? This is a bipolar jet. Uh, we released this image last year when one of the new Star Wars movies came out. So we called this a double-bladed lightsaber, all right? <laughs> and, uh, and if you look carefully, you can see another jet from another protostar. You can't see the protostar itself. It's buried in here, but you can see these interesting jets. They're all signs of activity. Stars are still forming. Um, if you look closely back in the Orion Nebula, we're looking back in the core here, lots of bright stars. But if you look very carefully, you see some other objects in here. And I'm going to blow them up here. Here's a couple of stellar objects. But blown up, you can see these dark disks around them. This one's kind of face on in its orientation to us. This one's kind of edge on. But these dusty disks around the star are about the size of our own solar system. Right? That's their diameter. So it turns out that we now understand that planets are forming in these dusty disks around young stars. And a very hot topic in astronomy now is studying these disks, these planet-forming disks around young stars. It's hard to do because they're so dusty you can't really see much in them. But again, if you look in infrared light or in radio waves, uh, you can see sometimes more detail in these disks. So here's an example. The uh, Alma... Uh, um, large millimeter and submillimeter wavelength array of telescopes in South America, which you see here, work together to get very sharp images in radio wavelengths of light. So this is another one of these circumstellar disks. The star is in the middle. You can't see it as an individual star here, but you can see these, the disk, and you can see that it's actually chopped up into these rings, kind of like the rings around Saturn. And, uh, a lot of astronomers believe that rings are carved out when there are orbiting bodies. So we know that rings, are, that, that moons are responsible for the rings around Saturn. Here we know that there are objects um, orbiting, uh, possibly forming in this disk, planets around this star that are responsible for the disk structure. So that's a hot topic right now as well. Uh, I mentioned to you Jupiter. All right, we have activity in the formation of stars and planets. We also have activity when stars get old. So eventually, after a long period of time, stars use up all that hydrogen in their core that's been fusing to create the starlight. The hydrogen is fusing and becoming helium and heavier elements. When that happens, the star starts to become unstable because it's got light coming out from that reaction to balance the gravity trying to pull everything in. But if you make that balance unstable because there's running out of hydrogen, things get unstable and you can uh, cause a star to eventually burn out. Um, on its way to burning out, it goes through some interesting phases. Here's an old star buried in the middle here. You can't see the individual star under the dust, but it's expelling its outer atmosphere in a quite spectacular fashion. That's a common phase. And uh, this expelled gas is moving quite rapidly. It's also quite beautiful here. Um, it, looks, uh, it looks like something, so it's got a name. Anybody know what the name of this, and we, again, we call it a nebula because it's kind of a fuzzy, gaseous thing. Anybody know what the name of this one is? The butterfly, right. So it looks kind of like a butterfly. So butterfly nebula here. Um, here's something a little more exotic. So here's an old star that has, again, expelled its atmosphere, but not through a gentle a process, this star actually exploded. So the most massive stars, when they run out of fuel, they will explode in something called a supernova. So this is the remnant of a supernova explosion that happened a thousand years ago. Astronomers, or I don't know what they were called a thousand years ago, but people watching the sky from China and around the world actually recorded seeing this star suddenly brighten up. So humans have been watching this for a thousand years as the debris expands out. This Hubble Space Telescope image gives us a lot of detail about that. We see the different colors here from different filters on the camera. That tells us the different kinds of elements that are in this gas. So it's not only the leftover hydrogen, but 
it's also the other elements that have been forged. Hydrogen fuses into helium in the interior of stars. But then there are heavier elements that are formed as well. Oxygen, carbon, iron, even heavier elements formed during the process of the explosion. When the star explodes, it expels this enriched material into the interstellar medium. So if you studied chemistry, you know your periodic table these heavier elements beyond hydrogen and helium are produced in stars. They're expelled into the interstellar gas, into these nebulae. Then the next generation of stars that can form out of this gas sweeps in some of that enriched heavier material with the other atoms and enables it to be a more enriched star. And eventually planets and these dusty disks can form out of solid materials, including silicon um, and iron things like that, and carbon. So stars play a very interesting role. We can look at that more specifically when we use spectroscopy. So here, this, here's a field of stars, but you see the purplish light here is debris from another one of these supernova explosions. So this is a supernova remnant, we call it. But we want to see what it's made of. What are these elements that were forged in that star that are now being expelled out into space? Well, we could look at any of it, but this is just a kind of a random region here, circled here. And we're going to look at it with something called a spectrograph. So a spectrograph is like a prism. It takes the light, but spreads it out into its constituent colors. And in regions like this, instead of seeing every color of the rainbow, you see only certain colors, or we call them wavelengths or frequencies of light. The pattern of that light is indicative of what's emitting that light or what's in the gas. And so when we do that, we see this. So here's the spectrum from this supernova. The spectrum spreads out the light according to its color, or in this case we're calling it wavelength. It's the same thing, different colors. And this axis tells you the brightness of the light at every particular wavelength of light. So for most of the spectrum, there's not much brightness. But at a few points, it's very bright. And so a spectroscopist can look at this pattern and say, that is the pattern, in this case, of oxygen. And I see also the pattern of carbon. So you can tell what's in the supernova remnant. You can tell that the star produced through these fusion reactions over time, not only helium, but also oxygen and carbon, these are elements we need for life and expel them into interstellar space. They're available for future generations of stars and planets. We can look at whole galaxies and see activity. So there's our, our pretty spiral galaxy again, but we now know that galaxies actually interact with each other. So here's an example of two galaxies that are being kind of drawn together by their mutual gravitational pull. Um, when galaxies merge, it's not usually like a bunch of stars running into each other because most of the volume is empty space. But what happens is that the mutual tidal and gravitational forces can eventually disrupt the structures of these individual galaxies and their spiral arms, and they eventually merge into one combined galaxy. And when we look into the distant universe, which is kind of like looking back in time, we can actually see that merging was an important process and has been all along in the history of the universe. Here's another pair of galaxies that are farther along in this process of merging. So they've kind of lost their spiral arms, but you can see how bright they are. What happens is that all the turbulence incited by this process stirs up the gas, and that can cause more of these stars to coalesce out of the, the clumps of gas. And so you get what's called a starburst. So all these colorful nebulae are regions where stars have recently turned on in a very aggressive fashion here. Um, this is interesting, and we also see evidence in our own Milky Way that our galaxy has had mergers in the past. But uh, lest you think you are safe and secure, um, we also in the last couple of years have confirmed that our nearest neighbor, big spiral galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, is on a head-on collision course with our own Milky Way. So we have a merger, at least one in the future, as well, and probably the little dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way may eventually merge with us as well. So merging is a very active process. By the way, the models show that individual solar planetary systems probably aren't disrupted too much, so you can take a deep breath of relief. Um, the night sky may look different, though, in about four billion years when this is projected to happen, okay? 
All right, so we've learned that the universe is beautiful, the universe is active, it's also enormous in both space and time, and I want to show you some of this as well. It's awe-inspiring. So there's our sample galaxy again, but we now know there are a lot of other galaxies. Keep in mind that galaxies like this contain hundreds of billions of stars, and now we know there are hundreds of billions of other galaxies, right? We've only known that for... Uh, you know, just less than a century now. So here is another famous Hubble Space Telescope image. It happens to be my favorite. But this is not an image of stars. This is an image looking at a region of the sky that has uh, not very many nearby stars to kind of drown out the view. Instead, it's a pretty boring blank spot in the sky unless you just stare at it for days and days and collect light, which is what was done with the Hubble Telescope. The result was that they were able to record the faintest objects that would show up in this deep field. And all of these little blips of light um, are galaxies. There's a couple of stars in the foreground, which you see with this kind of stellar diffraction pattern that happens here. But all these other blips of light are entire galaxies. If you imagine each one of these being like our Milky Way and each one having hundreds of billions of stars, even the little ones may have billions of stars. That's kind of mind-blowing. And this is a very small region of the sky. Think of it about kind of the area of what you would see if you were looking through a soda straw. Now imagine that extrapolated over the whole sky. Uh, this is the kind of universe we live in. If we could get far away and look back at our own Milky Way, our, our galaxy would look like one of these spirals here in the distance. So. Um, I hope that, that every time I look at this, I still get the chills, all right? It's, it's just incredible, this universe that we live in. It's enormous. It looks like there's something like, well, we thought there's something like 200 billion galaxies, 200 billion galaxies in the universe that we can observe. Now, recently, there's been some observations and calculations based on the faintest objects you can see in deep space, realizing that actually there may be 10 times more if you count up all the faintest little tiny fragmentary galaxies, there may be something more like 2 trillion galaxies in, in our observable universe. So these numbers are hard for us to fathom, but they are huge, all right? And they get people's attention. So when this uh, ultra-deep field, enhanced field, came out a few years ago, it made the cover of USA Today. Um, it even got the attention of the Huffington Post, which is not normally very reverent, but here we are with Holy Hubble. Um, and keep in mind there's a third dimension always in astronomy, the distance dimension. How far away are different stars and how far away are these different galaxies? They're not all at the same distance. So astronomers work very hard to gauge distances. Here's another image of the deep field, but blowing up one of the smallest, hardest to see galaxies in the field, blown up here and again here, um, it's just kind of a smudge, really, it looks like. Uh, but it's very interesting. This is one of the most distant galaxies that we've ever seen in astronomy. Not much to look at because these galaxies that are very distant are, tend to be very small. They don't have that beautiful spiral structure yet. Um, they haven't formed as many stars yet. And yet, when you gauge the distance to this thing and you measure its distance, you realize that this is an object shining to us from way back in time. Think about this. The universe is a time machine. Everything we look at, it's taken time for the light that we see to get to us. So the sunlight that we receive actually is the way the sun looked eight minutes ago because it's taken eight minutes for that sunlight to get to us. When we look at the Andromeda galaxy, our nearby, nearest nearby spiral galaxy, that's two million light years away. This galaxy is more than 10 billion light years away. A light year is a unit of distance. It's the, it's the amount of distance that light travels in, in a year. So with astronomy, we're seeing things very distant in space, which means we're seeing them as they were very far back in time. And this is one of the earliest baby galaxies that we have ever seen. Over time, galaxies like this will merge with other galaxies. They'll get bigger, and they'll have a lot of generations of stars. We can see them developing 
these heavier elements through the stars that come and go. Here's another way of looking at this. As telescopes get better and better over time, which is what this chart is showing over the last few decades, telescopes on the ground, different instruments on space telescopes, a future space telescope that's, um, that will launch in 2018 next year, the James Webb Space Telescope, um, the cameras have gotten more sensitive. So when you have a more sensitive camera, you can see fainter and fainter objects. Well, that means, in part, you can see fainter and fainter galaxies in space with your telescope, which means you can see objects that are more distant. That's what these arrows are representing. So we can see farther out in space, which translates to seeing farther back in time because it's taken longer for that light to get from these distant galaxies to our telescopes. So this bottom axis here from right to left is a gauge of the time involved for the light to get to us. We're seeing back several billion light years. And in fact, if you think of the beginning of our universe off here to the right, we're seeing galaxies as they were forming just recently after the beginning of the universe. You know, nearly all astronomers now agree that the evidence shows that our universe had a very striking, energetic beginning. That it was not always here. A few decades ago there was an argument about whether the universe had a beginning or whether it was steady state. And a lot of uh, astronomers didn't like the idea of a beginning because that seemed kind of theological, that was kind of uncomfortable. But now, almost every direction of evidence you look at shows that our universe had a, a beginning, um, a burst of energy, an inflationary period, and all the evidence points to that happening about 13.8 billion years ago. We're now seeing baby galaxies from within the first 0.8 of that 13.8 billion year history of our universe. Now there may be other universes out there as well, that's a multiverse idea, but we're talking about our own universe right now. What we can also do in astronomy is compare now these very distant galaxies, what they're composed of, what they look like, what they're shaped, the baby galaxies, to galaxies a little closer to us in time and space. They're a little bigger, a little more mature. And compare that to galaxies in our own epoch of time, including the features of our own Milky Way galaxy. And we can see how galaxies have changed over time, over the history of the universe. So astronomy is indeed like a time machine. And in fact, galaxies have changed. The early galaxies, as I mentioned, don't look the same as galaxies like our own. Their composition is simpler. They haven't yet had generations of stars come and go to produce these heavier elements like carbon and oxygen. They haven't had as many mergers to grow together. You can see that a little more clearly here when you take out some of these galaxies from the, uh, um, from the deep field image and group them according to their distance. So these galaxies are the closest ones to us, and they're, these are, um, you know, within a light year or so, um, uh, not a light year, sorry, within, um, within basically a few hundred million light years, and then we have maybe a billion light years, maybe two, maybe four, maybe six going out, and you see as you get farther and farther in space and farther back in time, the galaxies are very small and fragmentary in the early universe, and they change. And we can compare everything about them from the early baby galaxies to ones more like ourselves. And we see that they've changed. They've matured over time. So what we see by looking at this, these dynamics of the universe as a whole is that the universe has developed over time, and it continues to mature and change with the production of stars, um, heavier elements being produced within those stars, and planets that form in these heavy element disks that form around stars in the more mature universe. And these conditions that enable the formation of planets and so forth are providing conditions needed for life to thrive on at least one planet. You know, we know life exists on one planet. We don't know yet whether intelligent life exists on any planet, but we, that's a joke. Okay, so um, we know that the conditions of the universe over time have changed, and the conditions of the universe that we are in right now enable life that relies on carbon and oxygen and iron 
to thrive on this planet, which is made of that solid material where we have water, we have continents, and life is thriving. We can see the whole history of the universe leading up to these kinds of conditions. Does that imply a purpose for the whole universe? All right, I have just moved from a scientific discussion. All I've been talking about up to now is what we think we observe and understand through our scientific instruments to a question that is beyond science alone, purpose. You can't go out with a telescope and a microscope and measure purpose, um, whether you have 47.5% you know, purpose or not. We can't, we can't do that kind of measurement. That's a different kind of question. It's not a science question. Different people have interpreted what they see in the heavens in different ways. The psalmist would see here that there's definitely purpose in the universe. The psalmist in Psalm 19 in the Bible is recorded as saying, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his, pan of his hands. That's the purpose. Day after day, they're pouring forth speech. Night after night, they're revealing knowledge. They don't have speech like our words or language. They don't use words. No sound is heard from them. And yet somehow their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. There's some message that the heavens is telling us um, that is understandable around the world. And even just in science we understand that. We work, I work with people from all over the world. Different cultures, different backgrounds. And yet when we're trying to ask a scientific question we look at the the data and we hopefully come to the same conclusion about the scientific question. Here's a deeper philosophical question. Are the heavens declaring something richer? In this case the, the, uh, the psalmist says yes, it's declaring something about the glory of God and you can think to yourself what kinds of aspects of the glory of God would the universe um, be conveying? I can think of things like, um, and again this doesn't come from the science data, it comes from philosophical reflection, but I could think of things like beauty or that, that, that God is a, a, a powerful, creative, loves beauty, um, has, not, um, has, has enabled life to thrive, uh, has developed order, the, the physical processes that we study in, in, in nature, and yet those physical processes still allow for freedom uh, as well. All these things are different aspects that you can infer. Um, even uh, theologian John Calvin, centuries ago, said that astronomy is not only pleasant, but it's also useful to be known. It cannot be denied that this art unfolds the admirable wisdom of God. So that was his view. But you don't have to take that view. Not everybody looks at the same data and comes to that same uh, conclusion. Um, here's another positive conclusion. Uh, some of you are familiar with this wonderful hymn, How Great Thou Art. And uh, I am not gifted with the talent of vocal expression, so I will just read this. <laughs> oh Lord, my God, when I, an awesome, when I an awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. So many people have a great sense of praise and, and awestruck wonder when, when they look at the heavens. I do, and I hope many of you do too, sometimes. But you can also have a different reaction. Um, here's a different one, which is perfectly valid. There is no valid or invalid here. Uh, physicist Steven Weinberg said, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. All right? So sometimes you can look at all of this and say, what's the point? The universe is growing and growing, but eventually it's going to keep expanding. What's, what is the point of this? So that's another reaction people have. Again, this is a philosophical query. So you can ask, does the universe have a purpose? And I show this because uh, the uh, John Templeton Foundation asked that question to a group of leading scholars and academics uh, a few years ago, theologians, scientists, other thought leaders, and they were asked to say whether they thought the universe had a purpose. And again, that's something you can't measure with a telescope or a microscope. So even thought leaders in science and other fields can come to different conclusions. And so you might recognize some of these names here. Um, now, what's more important than the little quick answer here is that they each wrote a, a quick, a one-page essay. So if you go to this website here, 
uh, templeton.org slash purpose, you can actually read why they gave the answer that they gave. Some would say absolutely not. You can't uh, think of things like purpose anymore in an age of science. Others would say um, absolutely. You know, I can't even imagine there not being a purpose when you see this kind of, uh, these kinds of phenomena going on. And some would say, uh, I'm not sure, maybe there is. Neil deGrasse Tyson would say, maybe there is, but he's not quite sure what it is because it depends on who you ask. You know, if you ask your, uh, the bacteria that live in your gut, they would say that the purpose of the universe and of you is to give that bacteria a nice, warm, cozy place to live. So, you know, whose purpose and what does that mean? So, you know, how you ask the question... Um, and what you're getting at can be interpreted differently. This is a philosophical question. If my uh, computer was working like I wish it were working right now, I would go to some of these little essays and read them to you. But the point here is that whether the universe has a purpose overall or not is a philosophical question. The science can kind of inform how you ask that question, but it can't answer it. It's, it's a bigger question than science alone can answer. Um, Freeman Dyson, physicist, said that it would not be surprising to him if it should turn out that the origin and destiny of the energy of the universe cannot be completely understood in isolation from the phenomenon of life and consciousness, and that the design of the inanimate universe may not be as detached from the potentialities of life and intelligence as scientists of his century, the 20th century, have tended to suppose. In other words, he's allowing himself to imagine that maybe this whole physical evolution of the universe, this inanimate process that we're teasing out, may not be completely divorced from the outcome of, of life that we're enjoying now. Just a thought. So what about this perspective of faith? How do you think about faith perspectives as you're also thinking about scientific data? And I'm not going into a full lecture on that topic tonight, but you know, some of the questions is, can science and, and religion both address truth? Um, and how does a biblical view of the cosmos relate to a scientific view? Some of you may wonder that. I think as you look at those kinds of questions, it's helpful to remember that science, and I love science, I'm a scientist, but science is very good when it's addressing certain kinds of questions, questions of how and when and why in terms of physical cause and effect and the natural history of the universe. Um, but it's not very good at asking these bigger questions like why, capital W, and those where faith perspectives are better at looking at, is there a purpose for it all? Is there a God? How should we live? So, you know, using the right kind of tool to answer the right kind of question is really key here. And a lot of people get that wrong. A lot of religious leaders get that wrong when they try to use faith tools to answer scientific questions. And a lot of scientists get that wrong when they try to use scientific tools to answer bigger philosophical questions um, that are informed by science but not completely answerable by science. Um, that said, there's some perspectives that are interesting. I also mentioned uh, Freeman Dyson again, who said, why are we here, capital W? Does the universe have a purpose? Where comes our knowledge of good and evil? These mysteries and a hundred others like them are beyond the reach of science. And Francis Collins, um, a well-known geneticist who uh, now leads the National Institutes of Health, he says we can't discover, we cannot discover through science alone the answers to the questions why is there life anyway, and why am I here, capital W? Um, the National Academy of Sciences has even said that religion and science answer different questions about the world. So that's a good perspective to add. And let me just quote here Sir John Polkinghorne, who's a physicist who became a, a, a priest, an Anglican priest later in his life, and has done many terrific books on how to relate science and religious faith. And he said that science and theology are both concerned with the search for truth. All right? In consequence, they actually complement one another rather than contrast one another. And he says, of course, they're looking at different kinds of truth, different disciplines, focusing on different dimensions of truth. But they share this common conviction that there is such a thing as truth to be found. You know, there's a lot of assumptions in our postmodern world that there is no such thing as, as truth. It's, it's all relative, and that is interesting that in certain religious traditions, and especially Christianity and related faiths, 
and in science, there's still this idea that there's, some, there's a right answer, there's something to go for, and that's a commonality, I, I think, that Sir John Polkinghorne uh, found very compelling. There are, however, some tough questions. It's not, so, it's not enough to just say the universe is magnificent, it's majestic, it's incredible, and stop with that. Um, what will the long-term future of the universe hold? That's a puzzling question. Scientifically, it looks like our universe is expanding and even accelerating in that expansion. Um, the stars will eventually burn out if the universe continues on its current course. What does that mean for the future of humanity? Um, theologically, how do we think about this? And then there's the question of significance. Many people look at these images and things and they say, wow, we are, we are really insignificant because our little planet is so small around this one little star in the edges, in the outer realms of this one galaxy. What does it mean? Are we significant given the vastness of the universe in space and time and even the possibility of a multiverse, that there are many universes? Well, I don't have time to answer all of that because I don't know the answers to all of that, but I will say that there are different ways of looking at it. Um, this is a, a quote from Carl Sagan, a famous astronomer that I greatly admire when I was growing up, really inspired me to think about the vastness of the universe. But he had a different philosophy than I have in terms of interpreting it. Um, he said, who are we? We find that we live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star lost in the galaxy, tucked away in some forgotten corner of the universe. The end. Do you ever feel that way? <laughs> um, and you can certainly take that perspective if you believe that your significance is only measured by your place in the universe or your lifespan. So um, if that's how you view significance, then... I have news for you, you are not the center of the universe and your lifespan is not very long compared to most entities in the universe. So that's a bummer in some sense, but in another sense you can glean significance in a very different way. And here the psalmist who wrote Psalm 8, who also looked up at the heavens, had a very different perspective. Now uh, if this is a psalm of David looking up at the night sky, we remember that he had a lot of time to, as a shepherd, to stare up at the night sky before he became a king. And he said, O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you've established, and here's this sense of insignificance he's feeling, what are human beings that you're mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? So he didn't even know about galaxies. But he's already feeling insignificant. He's looking at the moon, he's looking at the stars, he's feeling insignificant. But he goes on, he says, and yet you made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You've given them dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under their feet. This is really significant. He's viewing that significance is not coming from place in the universe and uh, being you know, the, the main feature, but he's saying that God has given us special significance. And we can even see this through science. He says here, he's given us dominion over the works of your hands. Well, what does that mean? He was looking up at the moon and the stars. He knew at that point that human beings weren't having a lot of physical hands-on dominion of the stars and the moon. But in this case, I think dominion can mean understanding and wisdom. I really believe science is part of God's great gift to us to help us understand the universe and the creation that we're part of. That's part of dominion. That's a great gift if we use it for good purposes. There's more tough questions. Life on planet Earth is not always beautiful, as everyone in here knows. Um, Here's some examples of tough questions. Why do some of the same physical processes that are so important for the physical development of the universe and the Earth um, also cause such pain at the same time? How can a good creation and, uh, also be good and, and seemingly bad at the same time? We think of plate tectonics. We now know that our Earth is dependent on the, the movement of the continents on the plates. It helps recirculate our atmosphere. Atmospheric constituents go into our oceans through the continental motions. They are, um, uh, 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 they, they, the continents go under one, the plates go under one another 
that helps to recycle material from the atmosphere to deep into the earth and then it's expelled again through volcanoes and action like this. It's because we do not have a stagnant earth that we have a vibrant, refreshed atmosphere. Unlike some of our neighboring planets like Venus that does not have this plate tectonic process, the atmosphere has gone stale into a, a terrible greenhouse condition which is not pleasant for life. So let's praise God for plate tectonics, right? What a wonderful thing. Except this is also what causes earthquakes, which are terrible things. So it, it caused much grief and death. So, you know, there's not a simple answer to, to the natural processes, whether they are good or bad. And, of course, we do evil things to each other. Even, even other animals uh, do things to one another. We do things to animals. Is this just all part of the wonderful natural order, or is there something wrong in this? Is there such a thing as evil? I don't think we have a microscope or a telescope that's an evilometer that can measure things scientifically. And yet we all know that there's something not quite right in the way we treat one another, right? And even the way we treat other animals, I think of beautiful animals that, um, that populate our planet, and yet they are suffering now, often at the hands of humans. Here's the elephants, and I just pull this out as a sad example. Um, but uh, elephants recently have been the subject of, of just targeted, vicious attacks. Uh, their whole herds gunned down with automatic weapons just to get their tusks, just to sell them on the market. And then uh, elephants actually grieve their loved ones. They're deeply social creatures. The, the, the living ones will come back and mourn the dead, and those get gunned down too. This is horrible, right? Why are things like this happening on planet Earth? This is a theological question as well as just a natural question. I throw these in because it's too simple to say the universe is wonderful and magnificent and just walk away. It's also too simple to say it's purposeless and just walk away. These are deeper questions that I think should foster deeper conversations in your uh, churches and classrooms and homes and in your mind. Um, I'm not a theologian, but the biblical perspective on this um, in the Christian faith is centered on something we call the incarnation, that the God who is responsible for the universe and all we study in science is also very concerned about us in our lives in an individual scale and has actually entered creation in that sense as a physical human being um, to experience life with us. And the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is absolutely central to our faith to my faith and to the faith of Christians around the world. And many of the answers or dealing with these difficult questions are found when you look deeply into the meaning and the implications of that incarnation. The same, in, in Christian thought, the same Savior who incar becomes incarnate is the same God who's upholding the universe, who's responsible for the cosmos that we study. It's kind of a mind-boggling thought. All right, from closing thoughts here, um, the universe, we're not done studying the universe. The universe always holds new discoveries, new mysteries, new surprises. There's always new things to do. So some of you younger folks or even older folks in here, I hope you'll get interested in astronomy and in science and help us to investigate some of these mysteries. Here are some of them I don't have time to get into this evening too much, but what is dark matter? It appears that there's a lot of matter out there. We see its gravitational tug within galaxies and so forth, but we can't see any light from it. We don't know what it is, so we just call it dark matter. What's dark energy? We know something is actually accelerating the expansion of the universe, that space is stretching and the galaxies caught up in that space is, are moving apart from each other. And now we know that that stretching of space is actually getting faster. When I was back in school, we knew it would, should be slowing down because gravity should be pulling galaxies back toward each other again, or at least slowing down the expansion. Now we see that that expansion that's happened ever since the beginning of the universe, that expansion, which was initially slowing down, is now speeding up. What's pushing the universe apart? We don't know. We just call it dark energy right now. Closer to home, are there other planets? like Earth, um, outside of our solar system. And could there be life on some of those planets? Those are big, hot topic questions. We know that there are hundreds of billions of stars in our own galaxy. Here's an image of the, toward the center of our galaxy. It just shows you how many stars and dust and lots of stuff down there. Only one star in our galaxy is our sun. So it's thought, you know, surely there are other stars that have planets 
Are we the only one? We didn't know that. We didn't know the, other, the answer to this question until recently, whether there are other planets in the universe. We still don't know if there's another Earth-like planet with life. We're still looking for that. We're looking for evidence of potential habitability even in our own solar system. This is an image of a moon of Jupiter known as Europa. Very interesting moon. It's ice covered. And you see cracks in the ice here. It's very cold. But because of the tidal forces on this moon, it's thought that the inside of this moon might actually be perpetually heated up by motions going on in there. And the interior heat can melt some of this ice from the inside, which means there's probably a, an ocean of water under this ice. So where there's water on Earth, there's always life, even microbial life. So the curiosity as to whether there could be even microbial life on Europa, it's hard to study because you'd have to drill down through the ice to test this water. We don't have a probe that can yet do that. More recently, we've actually seen plumes of water vapor, we think, escaping from cracks in the ice. And so now it's thought, wow, if we could actually send a probe to test those water vapor plumes, we could learn more about the water in Europa. How interesting would that be? There you go. So this is an image of Europa from the Galileo probe, and these are plumes uh, image with the Hubble Space Telescope there. We're seeing planets around other stars. Again, we started this evening talking about exoplanets, planets outside our solar system. So here's an artist's conception of a star with planets orbiting it, but these are these is real based on real data of a real star system that has six planets that are in tightly bound orbits. A lot of these planets that we're discovering, we're not taking pictures of. That's too difficult. We're discovering them indirectly by seeing their effects as their mutual gravity causes the star to wobble or as they transit in front of their parent star and block out some of the starlight. We can even study the atmospheres of some of these planets when the starlight comes through the surrounding limb of the atmosphere and toward our telescopes, and we can see what components of that atmosphere absorb some of the starlight that tells us what's in the atmosphere of the exoplanet. So lots of interesting little investigator techniques being developed. This is a histogram. A histogram is telling you here in all these years going forward from the 1980s to uh, 2015 and beyond, how many of these exoplanets were discovered in each year or in each bin of years here. So back in the 80s, there were zero. And then these indirect techniques were perfected of how to find these tricky little planets. It's hard to see a planet around another star because planets are very dim and small and can be a million times or even a, a billion times dimmer than the star. And they're kind of lost in the glare. So you have to find these indirect ways of detecting them. But astronomers have gotten better and better at that to the point where now we're discovering more than 1,000 every year. I haven't updated this, this plot um, for a little while, but the, the numbers keep going up. And now astronomers are doing not only just counting, but trying to do some, some analysis. Um, last year, there was an announcement that uh, the nearest star to our sun, uh, the nearest star system is Alpha Centauri system. It's only four light years away. It still takes four years for the light to get to us from that star, but that's very close. And there's an exoplanet discovered around one of the stars in the system. There are, there's Alpha Centauri uh, system, and then there's Proxima Centauri, which is another star in that system. It's a little dwarf star. You can hardly see it here. It's a tiny thing. But this little dwarf star has a planet, and that planet may actually be in what we call the habitable zone around the star, meaning that it's close enough that it's not all frozen but it's not so close that all the water, if there are, is any on that planet, would be frozen away. So this is exciting. So you can bet that there's going to be a lot more uh, attention of the star system. We need a little bit better telescopes and a little more sensitivity to study the character of these planets. But we're getting to the point where probably in the lifetime of many of you in this room, we will be able to say whether we see evidence of life, maybe just simple life like bacteria, but evidence of bio biological activity on planets in other star systems, and maybe even on planets in, in our own solar system other than the Earth. So that's very exciting. Right? Um, this is an artist's conception of what it might look like if you were on that planet around um, Proxima Centauri uh, and looking back toward your, your dwarf sun there, your dwarf star. 
Um, how are we going to know when, when our, as we keep developing these telescopes and looking at these distant systems? These stars are too far away for us to travel to right now, so all we can do is receive the light. How are we going to know if a planet that we're observing in another star system can support life? Well, we can look back at our own planet Earth and we can tell there's life here. How do we do that? Um, well, we see that there's oxygen in the atmosphere, and the oxygen in our atmosphere is being continually replenished by plant life around the globe. So that would be evidence for biological activity. If there were no uh, biological activity on planet Earth, the oxygen in our atmosphere would combine with other elements quickly and it would go away. So the fact that we had oxygen is evidence of active biology on the planet. We look for evidence of liquid water. Uh, it appears that all life on Earth needs to have some relationship to water. Now, of course, you could imagine that maybe some other planet, the life doesn't need water. But we start with what we know, and we know that water-based life is, is crucial here. So we look for evidence for water. That doesn't mean there'd be life if there is water on another planet, but it means it might be habitable. Um, we look for the reflected light from the planet to see if it shows signs of plant life in mass, which we can tell from looking at planet Earth that there's plant life in mass. And we can also tell... Other uh, markers of biological activity, we call these biomarkers here, and methane is something that's produced by animals, uh, especially livestock on our planet. You can actually detect it um, in the atmosphere. It's actually a greenhouse gas. It's not so great, but, but nevertheless, we can see it. So if we see methane on another planet, it might be a sign that we have found a bovine planet somewhere else. We don't know. Um, but we also have to rule out other explanations if we see these things. So this is a whole science called astrobiology. It's a new science field that's thriving right now as we're trying to understand all the extreme conditions of life on Earth and what, what it, how we would detect that life and signs of it from far away if we were looking at another planet. Um, and what if we find life? Um, here it gets into a more sociological question. How will society respond to the detection or to the non-detection of life, extraterrestrial life? And that includes even simple life. I mean, we're always thinking about these extraterrestrial civilizations. But are we prepared if we actually find that life, like small bacterial life, exists on other planets and, and it didn't originate here? That has all kinds of interesting theological and philosophical um, implications. And of course, what about if we find evidence of complex intelligent life? People have been thinking about this a long time. So the Greek uh, philosopher here, Epicurus, said there are infinite worlds, both like and unlike this world of ours. We must believe that in all worlds there are living creatures and planets and other things we see in this world. And he kind of was using the word world a little differently than we do. But you see people have been thinking about this a long time. Some people look at this image of these Greek philosophers. A lot of women look at this and say, okay, who's taking care of the kids? And who's, you know, <laughs> why do they get to just sit around and think about these things? But nevertheless, people thought about this a long time. The difference is that now, for the first time in human history, we are actually detecting planets outside our solar system, without question. We have not detected life yet beyond Earth. But we are now gathering scientific data at a very accelerated pace. So we will be able to start addressing this question with scientific data in the very near future. So we need to start asking some of these other questions. Um, what does it mean? Will it affect thoughts in, in different uh, parts of our society? Um, what about Christian thought? Um, uh, here uh, we have a Dominican priest, uh, Father uh, Denoya from the Vatican, who said, Christians have always understood that the entire cosmos is a creation of God, that any life anywhere is a divine creation. There would be absolutely no motive for scandal if scientists were to establish the existence of life elsewhere. Um, the, uh, the Catholic uh, uh, Church is very science-friendly, actually, and uh, they actually held, the Pontifical Academy of Sciences held a whole conference on astrobiology. Now, this cartoon, which they may consider unflattering, but it was kind of funny. It was on the uh, Washington Post when this conference was going on. It was a very serious science conference they held where they brought together theologians and scientists together to talk about astrobiology. And um, Father Funes, who directed um, the Vatican Observatory, was asked why they did this. And he said, why is the Vatican involved in astrobiology? Although astrobiology is an emerging field and still a developing subject, 
the questions of life origins and of whether life exists elsewhere in the universe are very interesting and deserve serious consideration. These questions offer many philosophical and theological implications. <coughs> I'm going to skip through this quickly, but I want to tell you that when people are asked whether or not if we find life elsewhere, whether it will disrupt their worldview, especially their religious convictions, most people, no matter what their faith tradition is, they think about it, and they say, no, if we detect life elsewhere, my faith will be able to embrace that somehow. But, and I don't have a chart for this, and this is Ted Peters, a theologian, did this survey. He asked these people also, which included non-religious people and people from different religious traditions, if they thought other people's worldview would be disrupted if we found life elsewhere. And many people thought that absolutely, you know, these other people, their world view system will be severely challenged or maybe collapse. Um, religious people thought that non-religious people would finally see evidence for God if, if we found life elsewhere. Non-religious people thought that, wow, we will finally show that all the religions on this planet are, are just silly because now we've seen life elsewhere. So, you know, many people feel like there's going to be a huge philosophical change when we find life elsewhere, but just not to them, right? So, so it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. How do we respond to this amazing universe that we've just tasted a little bit tonight, and how should we? Um, I think for one thing, we, we feel, many of us, a sense of humility, a sense of awe, a sense of curiosity to want to know more and investigate, and for many of us, a sense of praise for this marvelous, active, mysterious universe we live in. And I think also we can appreciate more our little planet, planet Earth, that we live on. We care for our own planet and all of its inhabitants, all the human inhabitants and all the other inhabitants as good stewards, and we explore and learn. I think these are some positive responses. Um, here's a picture looking back at planet Earth from the cargo bay of the, of the space shuttle after it had done one of these Hubble Space Telescope servicing missions. As you look back, this is the limb of planet Earth below. You see the sun setting below and shining through our little fragile atmosphere here. And I think you can tell from this that our planet is beautiful and its atmosphere is beautiful, but it's also quite thin and quite fragile. We need to take good care of our home. Um, I think science and discovery can also lift the human spirit, right? Science does a lot of good things. Um, this is a colleague of mine at Goddard Space Flight Center, Gladys Kober, and, and Gladys is a very good scientist. She works with data from different kinds of telescopes. But during her vacation time every summer, she often goes on a mission trip. And she went on a mission trip to a, a country, an Asian country, to an orphanage um, there. These are children in this orphanage. Many of them are children of martyrs. Their parents have, have died. The children have experienced trauma. But the children are, they are fortunate. They have uh, love. They have clothing. They have food. What they want to hear from, from Gladys, on her mission trip, they want to hear about space. So Gladys goes and tells them about what we're discovering in the universe, and it lifts their spirits. These kids want to be astronauts, just like all of us do, right? All right? So science and exploration, when properly shared, can lift the human spirit and can unify us when we really realize we're all citizens of this planet, and we can all have a sense of awe and wonder and, and, and can all kind of ask these same deeper questions. Here's a student at the Maryland School for the Blind. Um, she's visually impaired. I spoke to this class about some of these great, wonderful images that you've seen tonight. These students cannot see the images with their eyes, but we put tactile coding on these images from space so that a nebula feels different from a galaxy, and that feels different from a comet. And, and, and feels different from a planet and so forth. So these students c were enjoying the beauty and wonder of these images every, mu every much as we are with our eyes through their sense of touch. Um, astronomy lifts the human spirit. Astro um, I'm sorry, yes, astronomy and science lift the human spirit. And I think faith can also help science. Um, a, a religious perspectives help scientists understand the bigger questions that people have about the implications of scientific investigation and can also inspire scientists to do their science. Many scientists actually go into science because they are inspired from their faith 
to do this as an act of service and as an act of worship. And here's a wonderful book about that uh, by, Bo uh, by Ruth uh, Bankowitz. She's assembled this book called God in the Lab, How Science Enhances Faith, and how scientists can be inspired by their faith to go into science, and then how the science they do can actually end up enhancing their faith. Now, again, these are different, you know, scientific data, I don't think, directly gives us faith information, but there are ways in which doing science can enhance one's faith, and that's been true without, throughout history. To close, this is a beautiful image uh, from the Hubble, 20, Hubble Space Telescope's 25th anniversary that shows in this multicolor image that includes both visible and infrared light, a massive star system that's recently born out of this beautiful cloud. They're still forming protostars in this cloud. You see some of these columns. I think it's a nice juxtaposition of both the, uh, the content, the majesty, the beauty, and the activity that's going on in our galaxy, in our universe today. And I hope we can all just, regardless of, of different perspectives, but we can all just take a moment to think about how majestic the universe that we live in is. Um, so we live in a universe of wonder, a universe of life, at least on one planet, so let us indeed be amazed, awestruck, and thankful. And I thank you very much for your kind and long attention this evening.